20 minutes of presentation and we leave about 20 10 minutes for discussion uh dr jenga sir yes uh, we have just changed a little bit we are presenting case first because the presented the case is also linked to that kind of a thing and sure. followed by the journal no issues so the first, no issues first is the case sir no issues let's start dr jain yes sir Good evening, respected teachers and my dear colleagues. Today, I'm going to present a case of Mrs. Salma B, who is a 20-year-old female housewife, resident of Indore, presented with chief complaint of intermittent blood diarrhea with abdominal pain for last two years. History of presenting illness. Uh, she was apparently all right two years back. Then she had intermittent bloody diarrhea. The stools were of Bristol type 6, 7, with stool frequency of 3 to 4 stools per day, with small volume mixed with blood and mucus. Urgency was present and there was history of nocturnal and diarrhea. And initially there was <coughs> blood present in less than 50% of stools. Each episode of bowel movement was preceded with crampy abdominal pain. Abdominal pain was diffuse in location, crampy, mild to moderate in intensity, lived with passage of stools, there were no aggravating factors. One and a half year back, her stool frequency increased to six to seven per day with blood in almost every stool. So she got admitted in hospital, was evaluated and was diagnosed as ulcerative colitis. She was started on steroids, azathioprine and mesalamine. Her symptoms subsided in four days. Steroid was trepid, and she was since then she was on maintenance with azathioprine and mesalamine. And she had been in remission till now. Now she presented to us with <clears throat> complaint of bloody diarrhea with abdominal pain since last six days. The stool were of Bristol type 6 7 with stool frequency of 8 to 10 days at 8 to 10 bowel movements per day with blood in almost every stool. If they were associated with abdominal pain that was diffuse in location, crampy, mild to moderate in intensity, and was relieved with passage of stools. She also had headache since four days. That was hemicranial, throbbing type, associated with dizziness. There was no episode of vomiting or photophobia. She has been having these episodes. She has been having episodes of intermittent mild headache in past also, but they used to last for a few minutes and she never required any medication for them. She gave a history of weight loss of 5 kg over 5 months, but there is no history of anorexia and she has not been following any dietary restriction. There is no tenesmus, pain in perianal area during defecation, no perianal discharge. No associated fever, no abdominal distension, vomiting, cessation of flatus or stool. She denied history of joint pain, back pain, morning stiffness, redness of eyes, photophobia, skin lesions, or recurrent oral ulcerations. There is no history of OCP intake. Uh, Dr. Jain, uh, can I interrupt him? Please, sir. So, uh, I'm not going to the case to discussion, but because this is a DNB, um, class, I would uh, just ask you to do a few small, small things in your presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Jain would agree, like this slide, if you see, uh, you are going to be speaking in a bigger crowd at a higher platform in coming days. So I want your slides to be a little more perfect. Now look at the first line and your comma is after a gap after S. Now, same is true in the second line. Same is yes. true in the third line, fourth line. Now, by the third paragraph, you become correct. Your joint pain is followed by a comma, which is coming just after the word. Uh, go back to your previous slide. Now, in this slide, just see the arrangements. I mean, see, you are, uh, I mean, I'm not going to the subject at this moment. I just want you people to understand that presentation is very, very important. Now, in this slide, if you look at the first, second, and third line, hemicranial, throbbing, no vomiting. Now, V is capital and P is small. Now, when you say, however, it should ideally start in the same uh, justified as H, T, and N is doing. Now, again, in the last two lines, the two no should be 
justified they should be on the same point now these are very small things but that these are very important when you do a presentation so please uh, just make it a habit that when you are doing a presentation you are as perfect as possible dr jain you agree with me that these are small so, things but are yes sir it's it's uh, it's a very small thing but they are very important because when you make a presentation it should look like a proper presentation i fully agree with you sir all right carry on carry on i mean yeah. I, i just thought i must make it a point sometime she denied history of radiation in the past she denied history of pedal edema therefore she denied history of pathological fractures night blindness skin discoloration tingling imbalance in night numbness pitchy and bruising no similar complaint in past she gave her history of hemorrhoidectomy in december 2019 that was when she first had her symptoms at that time she underwent hemorrhoidectomy past history there is no history of tuberculosis diabetes asthma or any other chronic illness the history of tuberculosis in 2017 personal history diet is predominantly non vegetarian appetite is normal there is no history of smoking and alcohol intake no history of complementary and alternate medications her sleep is sometimes disturbed due to night time stool frequency her bladder habits are normal menstrual and obstetric history she attained menarche at the age of 15 years Yes, a menstrual cycle is regular. Uh, last menstrual period was on ninth of January, twenty twenty-two. She has two children, and both were delivered by normal vaginal delivery. There is no history of abortion. Family history: She was born to a non-consanguineous marriage. She has three siblings and two children. All are healthy. No similar history in her family members, and no history of jaundice in family. So to summarize after history, a 20-year-old female with two years history of large bowel diarrhea mixed with blood and mucus, with crampy, diffuse abdominal pain, sleep with passage of stool, responded to steroids, azathioprine and mesalamine, currently on azathioprine and mesalamine, presented with recurrence of symptoms, 5 kg weight loss and headache. Symptom analysis. abdominal pain it appears to be organic luminal bloody diarrhea that's organic inflammatory and large bowel type as it is small in amount associated with urgency abdominal pain she has headache that was hemicranial throbbing type associated with dizziness There was no vomiting, no photophobia, and she required IV analgesics for headache. So this might be to migraine, or in the background of you see with you know some presses we can think of cortical venous thrombosis. My differentials at this point are relapse of you see due to natural history, a superimposed infection due to C difficile or bacterial infections. or cmv infection other diagnosis that i would like to consider are intestinal tuberculosis ischemic colitis diverticular colitis so can you go back physical... can you go back to the previous uh, three slides back which was a very very important slide yes here now can you uh, can you further throw some lights on why do you say this abdominal pain is organic why do you say it's luminal why do you say bloody diarrhea is organic inflammatory and large bowel type you did mention a few criteria for making it large bowel but can you can you give us solid reasons for all five of them so abdominal pain she is having nocturnal diarrhea which is associated with abdominal pain so it's organic she has weight loss associated with it and abdominal pain is always preceding the is always associated with the movements of bowel it is relieved by the passage of stool so it is luminal pain okay and you said Sir, bloody diarrhea is organic so can there be bloody diarrhea can be inorganic or functional also under bloody diarrhea you have written organic so can Sir. bloody diarrhea be functional also so in case of uh, melingers uh, we can have so that will not be a bloody diarrhea so thank you 
what Dr. Uh, Goenka sir is asking is that when you say bloody diarrhea, it is almost always organic yes. because mm -hmm. it is mixed with blood, uh, mucus and uh, it is a loose stool mixed with mucus associated with abdominal pain. So you are right that it's a, it's a pathological, but you don't have to write it's an organic because bloody diarrhea is never in a functional component. It so a, on, only way I can think of a bloody diarrhea uh, being functional is that if are, you are saying that the patient has hemorrhoids, and the blood is because of the hemorrhoids and along with that there is something irritable bowel syndrome or something like that but you clearly mentioned in your history that the stool was mixed with blood and the blood is not separate from the stool so it is actually a manifestation of possibly a colitic process which is going on all right any shwini you want to make comment on that uh, so the other possibility is uh, I mean, you can diarrhea with hemorrhoids. That is also possible. Okay. Okay, carry on. So you must understand uh, that in an exam, when you are appearing, the examiner is not going to allow you to. He is not going to sail with your flow. He will interrupt you sometimes purposefully to irritate you. So be be comfortable with that. No examiner is going to flow, uh, fly with your flight. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, carry on. For general physical examination, she was average built in arrangement, conscious, oriented, the cardiac pulse didn't beat a minute, BP 120 by 76, temperature febrile, respirate 18 minutes, 18 hours. Diagnosis, clubbing, yes, yes. Uh, you need to you need to stop your video. Stop your video. I was saying broadband is not working properly. So if you stop your video, we'll be able to see the slides and hear you better. She was of average build and nourishment. See, they of average build and nourishment, conscious oriented. BP was 120 by 70. She was having tachycardia, pulse 110 beats per minute. A febrile. Respiratory rate was of 18 per minute. Weight 49 kg. Height 161 centimeter. BMI 18.9. Pelor was present. There was no ictrus, cyanosis, clubbing, edema, or lymphadenopathy. Thyroid and lymph nodes were not palpable. JVP is not elevated. No evidence of bitter spots, scleritis. No evidence of angular stomatitis, chilitis, oral ulcer, or glossitis. On systemic examination, per abdominal examination, on inspection, it was abdomen was normal in shape, symmetry. Umbilicus was in center, round and inverted. Hernial orifices were normal. There were few linear strata seen in the lower abdomen. All quadrants were moving equally with respirations. There were no dilated veins, scar marks localized swelling or lump with or visible peristalsis or pulsations on palpation there was no localized increase in temperature or tenderness there was no organomegaly percussion normal auscultation was normal on perrectal examination the perineal in perineal perianal area there were no sinuses fistulas or excoriation seen there was no localized tenderness Anal tone was normal. There was no mass or tenderness felt on rectal examination. And blood with stool was seen on fingertip. On proctoscopy, there was mucosal erythema with blood in lumen. On other systemic examination, respiratory system was normal. CVS was normal. CNS, in view of headache, it was examined in detail. The higher mental functions were normal. 
there was no nystagmus, eye movements were normal, cranial examination was normal, and there was no focal deficit. So after examination, my summary is a 20-year-old female with two years history of intermittent large bowel diarrhea blood with blood and mucus with crampy diffuse abdominal pain that relieved with passage of stool who responded to steroids, azathioprine and mesalamine and is currently on azathioprine and mesalamine presented with recurrence of symptoms, 5 kg weight loss and headache. And on examination, there was pallor and tachycardia but there were no signs of extraintestinal manifestation. My differentials are same. Relapse of UC, either due to natural history or superimposed infection, like serif colitis, bacterial infection, CMV infection. Other diagnoses that I would like to consider are intestinal tuberculosis, ischemic colitis, and diverticular colitis. For intestinal tuberculosis, the points that favor it are there is abdominal pain, weight loss, but the negative points are there is absence of fever, absence of constitutional symptoms of TB. The duration of disease is long, that is two years, and in between intervening period, she was norm normal. She was having bloody diarrhea, which, which is uncommon in tuberculosis. Uh, Sudhanshu, yes, sir. Do you know that uh, uh, association between ulcerative colitis and uh, intestinal tuberculosis? Do you have any idea how what percentage of ulcerative colitis patients can have tuberculosis associated tuberculosis? Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Thirty percent. No, your first thirty percent is too high a figure. It's not thirty percent. So. The point is that it is not uncommon, but it is not that common also. It's about 3 to 7% among the different cities. So a person having an ulcerative colitis can have a tuberculosis. And many a times when you uh, treat a person and you always thought of thinking of relapse, you should never miss a diagnosis of intestinal tuberculosis because it's a fully treatable condition. The other thing is that you mentioned about absence of fever and constitutional symptoms. So can you tell me how many percentage of patients approximately in GI tuberculosis would have fever? A very less. So why put that as a negative point? See, my is not having anorexia also and generalized weakness or malaise was also not there. But that's a uh, symptom of a relapse of uh, UC also. So what Dr. Goenka is saying that Yes, you can take it as a positive, but it is not that important that you put it as a number one. That could be taken into consideration, but not as a number one point. Mm -hmm. The number one point should have been that a long duration and patient did not have any symptom. This is a sudden onset. So it could be more of a relapse rather than this thing. And bloody diarrhea, you said rightly, it's very uncommon in tuberculosis. But it's again, do patient do present with bloody diarrhea also in tuberculosis. And what is the etiology of uh, bloody diarrhea and tuberculosis? Ulcerations. One is ulceration, other. Which causes pain also. Vasculitis. Vasculitis. Right. Go ahead. Ischemic colitis. Positive points are uh, points in favor are abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, female gender. Negative points are usually these patients have disproportionate symptoms, severe abdominal pain with minimum signs. There's no history of palpitation, CAT, hematological disorder, and coagulopathies. And again, the history is long. See, uh, what's the ratio of male is to female in ischemic colitis? You have put that as a positive point that it's a female gender, so ischemic colitis is a as a positive point. See, when you talk about a gender. You should only talk about gender when there are extremes, like in SLE, the systemic lupus erythematosus, if you talk about gender, I can understand that. But for ischemic colitis, I don't think that the ratio is so different that that yes. becomes an important point of differentiation. I think we should be a little careful about 
putting uh, gender as a positive point for ischemic colitis. Yes. Dr. Jain, yeah. you agree? Okay, yeah, I do totally agree. But only time when you have to put this is when they take OCPs. But you have said in your history categorically that she doesn't take any OCPs. So this point gets negated. So you should not have put it here. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, diabetical colitis. Positive points are abnormal pain, extreme, extremely uncommon to present with bloody diarrhea. Negative points are young age. There's no history of constipation. So why uh, why Crohn's disease has not come in your differential diagnosis? Why you have only talked about ulcerative colitis and tuberculosis, diverticular disease, and ischemic colitis? Why not Crohn's disease? So that you have to tell why not Crohn's in terms of prevalence, in terms of uh, other symptoms, what other examination. You have categorically said those so many things in your examination. So come out with those. Sir, because in Crohn's abdominal pain is more as compared. Uh, um, our patient does not have so much of abdominal pain in Crohn's. Oh, but abdominal you are, when you talk of diverticular colitis, you have put that as a first positive point. Abdominal pain is the first point because of which you are considering diverticulitis. Yes, but in Crohn's pain is severe and there are no perianal signs and symptoms. Uh, Crohn's have got perianal complications. So, uh, so what percentage of Crohn's disease would have only large bowel involvement? What percentage will have small bowel involvement? And what percentage will have both small and large bowel involvement? Approximately. Mostly, sir, they have ilio, uh, ilio, iliocecal involvement. Uh, isolated uh, small bowel involvement and large bowel involvement is less as compared. Mm -hmm. so in order of what is so one first is iliocecal, second is ileum or colon? Ileum, sir. First is iliocecal, second ileum, ileum and then third, third so is what colon. Percentage, what percentage? So around 50 60 percent is iliocecal, then ileum, mm -hmm. and what percentage is colon? Isolated colon. 10 12 percent i don't remember exactly but slightly more yes sir i don't yeah, remember sir correctly. yeah yeah it's around around uh, 40 50 percent would be ileocecal then 30 percent would be small bowel and about 15 to 20 percent okay. maybe only only large bowel <clears throat> but then uh, uh, usually uh, again the bleeding is not a Predominant feature, predominant. as unless the rectum is involved, because rectum is spared in about 50% yes. of the patient with uh, Crohn's disease. This patient had tenesmus, isn't it? Sir, so she had urgency. Okay. Uh -huh. So, what's the difference between urgency and tenesmus? In urgency, one has to uh, rush to the toilet, and tenesmus is. Uh, painful uh, straining uh, uh, futile painful straining desire to defecate desire to defecate repeatedly without any uh, sometimes with fecal matter sometimes without fecal all right go ahead the previous oh, investigation before you, go, before you go because i don't see any questions in the chat box so there are a few questions. Um, uh, Dr. Sohini has already answered one question. Achha. Okay, I didn't see in my chat box. Yeah, uh, no, it's a uh, you look at don't look at Q and A. Look at the chat box. Somebody has asked about headache and CVT. Okay, and she has already replied. Okay, carry on. Okay, now I have opened it up. So the first investigation in this patient. Uh, so then, if this patient would have come to you for the first time back in 2018 or 2019 when she had first started. what the first few investigation you would have ordered in this patient first uh, i would have done basic uh, cbc uh, serum electrolytes lfts oh. few very few investigation just would you go with the cbc uh, lfts and other thing or simple stool routine microscopy stool for uh, uh, infection and uh, stool for C. difficult infection. Yeah. Yes. yes, a stool for C. difficult infection, stool for calprotectin, and then for sigmoidoscopy. 
ओके गो हेड गो हेड the previous uh, investigation uh, colonoscopy of june 2020 was suggestive of severe ulcerative colitis mayo 3 and the histopathology was of severe ulcerative colitis so i don't this... know whether histopathology can be so pathognomonic so histopathology in an ulcerative colitis is not a pathognomonic feature it is suggest it suggests that there is a chronic disease by cryptitis crypt abscesses distortions along with uh, uh, inflammatory marker so you I don't know what the histopathologist said, right? You should say it's consistent with active colitis or active ulcerative colitis or severe ulcerative colitis. It is not a pathognomonic. Histopathology is not a pathognomonic feature of analysis. So, Sridharanthu, is there anything which is uh, very, very specific for ulcerative colitis on histology? Have you heard about penicillin metaplasia? Yes, sir. Uh, they extend beyond the hepatic flexure in case of. Uh... Uh, ulcerative colitis normally they are absent okay so um, uh, carry on we have only about 5 7 minutes left for this case uh, so the investigations that were done in a hospital it showed uh, pancytopenia or uh, lfts were normal uh, and serum uh, proteins were normal serum albumin was 3.6 between b12 when electrolyte state was normal A stool protein was suggestive of 10 to 12 WBCs. RBC is greater than 40. Stool for C diff toxin was negative. Stool for calprotectin was high. A flexible sigmoidoscopy was done, and uh, it was some uh, suggestive of rectum sigmoid and descending colon colitis. Uh, rectum sigmoid and descending colon showed mucosal edema, erythema, friability, loss of vascularity, and mucosal erosion. UCIS score was five. My endoscopic score was two. Biopsy was taken and sent for histopathology and CMV RT-PCR. This was a uh, biopsy uh, histopathology. It showed uh, infiltration with uh, cryptitis, cryptapsis, and decreased goblet cells and uh, cryptapsis. The architecture of crypts was distorted. It was suggestive of Active inflammation with features of ulcerative colitis. Can you point one... towards a uh, goblet cell in that histology? Can you show me a goblet cell by a pointer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. पॉइंटर इतना बड़ा है कि उससे सारा सारा कुछ कवर हो जाएगा और इट डजंट मैटर डजंट मैटर कैरी ऑन अच्छा ये क्या हो गया सो क्विक क्लिक कैरी ऑन सो बायोप्सी वाज सजेस्टेड ऑफ अल्सरेशन विद इन्फ्लेमेटरी ग्रैनुलेशन टिश्यू एंड अदर फीचर्स ऑफ एक्टिविटी इन फॉर्म ऑफ क्रिप्टाइटिस एंड क्रिप्टापसिस वन फीचर ऑफ क्रोनिसिटी इन द फॉर्म ऑफ क्रिप्ट डिस्टॉर्शन ब्रांचिंग it was suggestive of active ulcerative colitis and the the cmv rt pcr was 1 crore 26 lakh 60134 copies in view of headache her mri brain was done and it was suggestive of right sinus venous right transverse venous thrombosis the final diagnosis was moderately severe ulcerative colitis with my score of 9 true and love fit severity for ulcerative colitis was severe Because she was having a, a stool frequency greater than six, and she was anemic and tech, having tachycardia. One of the classification was E three S three, and it was superimposed CVMV infection with CVT. So she was transfused with the PRBC. Was started on steroids and can cyclovir and low molecular weight heparin. Her symptoms subsided in two days. Her stool frequency decreased markedly, and uh, there was very less blood in less than fifty percent of stools. and she was discharged so uh, i would like to say a uh, few points about thrombosis and uh, ibd so there were a couple of questions uh, which you can take from the chat box there somebody was asked uh, dr isha pahuja was there any need to do a fecal calprotectin in this patient and the second question from my side is that uh, how do you know the extent of the disease you have only done a sigmoidoscopy you said and you saw up to sigmoid colon descending colon Yes, it was from the previous. It was pancreatitis in the previous uh, endoscopy. 
Okay. Next one. So is the is the full length colonoscopy contraindicated in this case, uh, or you did not do it just like that? No, sir. In active disease, uh, we don't do full length colonoscopy. You mean in severe disease? In severe diseases. Yes, sir. Active uh, disease, you can do it, but it's in severe disease you want usually avoid. And what about the answer to that question by Doctor Isha? So it yeah, might be of prognostic significance if uh, calprotectin is more than thousand, then uh, there is a risk for uh, colectomy. Not for diagnostic purposes, but for prognostication. All right. So, um, if you want to review the subject, we have two or three minutes only. Yes. Dr. Jain, we are cutting down into the second sure. presentation. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's for perfect because the case is very interesting. All right, carry on. Uh, so, IBD is associated with two, two, twofold greater risk of venous thromboembolisms, and the disease activity is it is related to can, the disease activity. Can you go go to the slideshow because we can see the next slide also on the same screen. Okay. Sir. Yes, slide show me chale jao. slide show me. Yeah. And yeah. the thrombosis is related to the disease activity and is further increased during hospitalization. Uh, Thromboprophylaxis should be given to the patients who are admitted to IBD during hospitalization of any cause. This is the recommendation by international consensus on the prevention of venous and arterial thrombotic events in patients with IBD. And the thromboprophylaxis does not increase the risk of further IBT related GI bleeding in patients with active disease. So uh, this uh, picture shows uh, where all thrombosis can occur. All that are in bold are common sites of thrombosis, but uh, like we can see, CVT is not that common. CVT uh, only 1.6 percent of CVTs are attributed to IBD. CVT usually presents as headache, seizure, focal neurological deficits, alter consciousness, and papilledema. There are various varied presentations and low incidence, and it is not readily suspected. So this leads to delay in treatment and a poor impact on the prognosis. So we should uh, suspect uh, CVT in cases of headache if it's in the background of severe uh, flare of uh, IBT. Uh, next, uh, some points on CMV and IBD. There is a debate where it's the uh, CMV is, is an active pathogen or is an innocent bystander. The prevalence of CMV in UC increases with disease severity. It is 0 to 5 percent in inactive UC and 21 to 34 percent in severe, severe UC. And uh, one recent study done by Professor Vinita Ahuja in AIM showed that high mucosal CMV DNA virus predicts adverse short term outcome in patients with severe ulcerative colitis in terms of refractiveness to steroids and uh, colectomy so take home messages one should be vigilant for thromboembolic complications in patients of ibd and patients refractory to steroid treatment infectious causes especially cmv colitis should be ruled out before stepping up the treatment thank you so, so i just would like to summarize there are two important things which uh, we need to learn from this case one that Every time when you have a patient coming with a relapse, superimposed infection should always be ruled out because if it's a natural relapse, you have to step up the treatment. Sometimes you have to use immunomodulators and <clears throat> biologicals. So infection should be ruled out. And the second important point is that we are a little ignorant about thromboembolic complications of ulcerative colitis, and sometimes they may be fatal. Giving a uh, uh, Anticoagulants is not contraindicated, and at times it may be very useful, like in this patient. Third, most important, that if patient comes with sudden chest pain in an ulcerative colitis, always think of pulmonary embolism because that's an important complication of uh, the ulcerative colitis, especially thromboembolic events. Koenka, sir, you want to add anything to this? No, it's all right. I think a good presentation, uh, a case which is not commonly seen. Uh, as a venous uh, thrombosis, I think it's a good case. Let's move on to the second presentation. Um, yes, because good evening, teachers. Because you can you can switch on your video now. I think. Vikas is a final year student, or which year are you? Both final of year? them are final year, sir. Just just moved into third year. All right. Okay. So your dates for the exam has been declared today. 
is that the is that the batch yes sir yes sir yes sir. june is the dates isn't june it? 8 9 yes all right so good evening teachers uh, today i am going to present general club uh, my topic is predictors of sustained response with tofacitinib therapy in patients with ulcerative colitis in the background ulcerative colitis is a relapsing remitting inflammatory disease and uh, potentially involving rectum and uh, entire colon with the secondary loss of response to most of the treatment with a loss of response rate to 30 to 55 percent after maintenance therapy of around one year therefore multiple treatment options uh, are to be needed for treatment and in order to better characterize the patient population, optimize treatment and minimize adverse effect, there is a need to identify factors that are predictive of maintaining response to therapy. So, uh, where these biological act, biologicals act, uh, let's have a look. The immune response and inflammatory pathway of ulcerative colitis shows that tissue damage is driven by dynamic complexes of cells and cytokines. The understanding of immuno-inflammatory pathways of ulcerative colitis led to the development of novel targeted therapy. This diagram shows various cells and their inflammatory mediators, which leads to the uh, inflammation pathway. So uh, various cells like dendritic cells, T regulatory cells, CD8, CD4 cells, secret their inflammatory mediators like interleukins, TNF uh, factors, uh, interleukin 12, interleukin 23, various in, in, uh, nuclear pathways and integrins which are involved in the inflammatory cascade of ulcerative colitis. So these areas are the potential target of various biologicals which are made like tumor necrosis factor antagonist, inter anti interleukins, anti integrinis and today's uh, focus is on uh, in, uh, tofacitinib which, which is a JAK kinase inhibitor. So what is tofacitinib? It is a small sized synthetic drug that primarily inhibits JAK. JAK is JAK kinase 3 and 1, and to a lesser extent, JAK kinase 2 and tyrosine kinase 2. It binds selectively and reversibly to the ATP binding site of the kinase. This blocks the signal transduction of the receptor of several interleukins and interferons, thereby modulating the inflammatory and immune response. Therefore, its mechanism of action in ulcerative colitis consists of inhibiting several cytokines that are linked to the pathogenesis of the disease. So this diagram shows the cytokine binding to the receptor and these JAK kinase dimerize, but tofacitinib inhibits the phosphorylation of this JAK kinase, which thereby not docked by STAT and inhibiting the gene transcription and cytokine production, which leads to the inflammation in ulcerative colitis. So <laughs> what is, uh, by further knowing this uh, tofacitinib, now what is octave trial? Octave trial is a three, there are three trials in phase three, which are randomized double blind placebo control trials on moderate to severe ulcerative colitis patient receiving tofacitinib. So octave phase three uh, has octave induction one, octave induction two. Octave induction one included 598 patient and octave induction two included 541 patient. All these patients are of moderate to severe ulcerative colitis and received randomization with tofacitinib 10 mg or placebo. And the primary endpoint of this trial is remission at eight weeks. So those who achieved remission, they further went into octave sustain, which consists of 593 patient. And they received a randomization with tofacitinib 10 mg, 5 mg and placebo. And the primary endpoint of octave sustain was remission at 52 weeks. I have written, sorry, it is written 53, but it is 52 weeks. So our focus is on octave sustain. Octave sustain is interventional randomization parallel assigned double blind trial studied in a period from 2012 to 2017 at multiple centers with a primary purpose of treatment, including 593 patient or in which 198 received placebo 198 received tofacitinib 5 mg BD and 198, 197 received tofacitinib 10 mg BD. The primary endpoint in octave sustain was remission at 52 weeks, sustained remission at 24 and 52 weeks, clinical remission at 52 weeks, sustained remission at 
24 weeks and time to loss of response. So they defined various terms like remission, defined as total MEO score of less than two with no individual score, subscore of more than one and a rectal bleeding score, subscore of zero. Sustained remission they defined as remission at, at 24 weeks and 52 weeks. Sustained clinical response they defined as uh, clinical response at 24 and 52 weeks and loss of response defined by an increase in partial MEO score that is clinical MEO score excluding the endoscopic score of more than two points from the baseline on octave sustained for two consecutive visits at least two weeks apart with an increase in rectal bleeding subscore of more than one from baseline of octave sustained. So what were the results of their studies? That 34.9% of patients were in remission at 52 weeks. 20.6% of patients achieved sustained remission at 24 weeks and 52 weeks. 54 point of patients had a clinical response at 52 weeks and 51.5 percentage of patients achieved sustained clinical response at 24 and 52 weeks. The majority of patients who achieved this efficacy outcome uh, received profacetin 5MG and 10MG BD. So, so our focus is on the what are the basic characteristics which uh, determine this efficacy. So clinical characteristics at baseline of octave induction one that may predict efficacy outcome with maintenance therapy. In the group receiving tofacetinib 5MG and 10MG, patients who achieve remission, sustained remission clinical response or sustained clinical response at 52 weeks had lower proportion of prior TNF inhibitor failure as compared to those who did not achieve the same. Likewise, in clinical characteristic at baseline of octave sustain, that may predict the efficacy outcome with maintenance therapy. So in the group receiving tofacetin 5MG, higher proportions of patients had partial MEO score of less than 2 who, who achieved these clinical endpoints. Similarly, tofacetin 5MG group, higher proportion of patients had total MEO score of less than 3 who achieved these clinical outcomes like sustained clinical response, remission and sustained clinical and clinical responses at 52 weeks. In the group receiving tofacetin 5MG BD, less number of patients used corticosteroid who achieved remission, sustained remission and other clinical endpoints. So this table shows that uh, remission in the group tofacetin who achieved remission, prior TNF failure is less in those patients who achieved remission, that is 29.44 percentage. And in, in the tofacetin 10MG group, Prior TNF failure is less in the patient who achieved remission at 52 weeks, that is 42.5 percentage. Likewise, partial MEO score is also less in the patient who achieved remission in both the groups, tofacetinib 5MG and tofacetinib 10MG, that is 60.3 and 60.0. Total MEO score is also less in those patients who achieved remission. It is less than 3 in 50 percent of patients in 5MG group and 43.8% in the tofacetinib group. Was that statistically significant? Sir, it is uh, upcoming, sir. It is in the next slide that is these okay. figures are statistically significant. So association between baseline factors and achievement of remission at 52 weeks, lower endoscopic subscore at baseline of octave one and two had higher odds of remission at 52 weeks. And both tofacetin 10 mg BD versus placebo and tofacetin 5 mg versus placebo uh, were significantly associated with higher odds of remission at 52 weeks. Factors associated with a reduced likelihood of remission at 52 weeks were oral corticosteroid use and higher CRP values. So this first plot shows the association of remission and various parameters like Endos lower the endoscopic score, higher the odds of remission at 52 weeks. Likewise, patient who received tofacetin 10 mg versus placebo and 10 mg 5 mg versus placebo have higher odds of remission, that is 6.37 and 4.34, with a significant p-value at remission. Now, higher albumin at baseline of octave induction one and two were associated with higher odds of remission at 52 weeks. 
in patient receiving tofacitinib 5 mg but not in the 10 mg group older age was associated with higher odds of remission at 52 weeks among patient receiving tofacitinib 10 mg but not with the 5 mg group similarly lower partial mayo score less than 2 versus more than 2 at baseline of octave sustain was associated with higher odds of remission among patient receiving tofacitinib 5 mg and 10 mg so this plot shows the these association with the remission at 52 weeks albumin higher the albumin value higher the odds of remission at 52 weeks that is 2.31 partial mayo score of less than 2 is associated with remission at 52 weeks with a odd ratio of 2.33 and a p value is significant now association between baseline factors and loss of response during octave sustain pgs physician global assessment a part of mayo score Lower PGA subscore at baseline of octave induction 1 and 2 was associated with increased risk of loss of response during octave sustain. Factors at baseline of octave sustain that were significantly associated with increased loss of response during octave sustain were oral corticosteroid use and higher CRP. And factors associated with a reduced loss of response were higher albumin at baseline of an octave induction 1 and 2 and treatment with tofacitinib older age, lower PMS, and base, at baseline of octave sustain. So this forest plot shows the various association with time to loss of response. That is, lower the P physician global assessment score, higher the chances of time to loss of response. If the CRP value is high and there is oral corticosteroid use, there are higher chances of time to loss of response and with a significant p-value. The presence of extraintestinal manifestation at baseline of octave sustain was associated with increased loss of response among patients receiving tofacitinib 5 mg, but not with tofacitinib 10 mg. Higher CRP at baseline of octave sustain was associated with an increased risk of loss of response among patients receiving tofacitinib 10 mg, but not with 5 mg. Oral corticosteroid use at baseline of octave sustain were associated with an increased risk of loss of response among patients receiving tofacitinib 5 but not and 10 both. So this plot shows the time of loss of response with various features like extraintestinal manifestation at baseline. There is increased chances of time to loss of response. Similarly, higher the CRP value, more the chances of time to loss of response. Oral corticosteroid use both in tofacitinib 5 and 10 mg group, there are chances of time to increase loss of response. So these were the association and the various adverse effect uh, uh, seen in this study were summarized as the table shows the adverse effect and their association with the various group. Uh, first is the adverse effect leading to discontinuation. So a numerically lower proportion of patient who achieved remission lead to discontinuation of therapy. Simple as that. Next is the infections. Among patients receiving tofacitinib 5 mg and 10, 10 mg and placebo, a numerically higher proportion of patients rem with remission had infection compared to those without remission. Herpes zoster infection, the proportion of patients with herpes zoster, non-serious and serious, was similar in patients regardless of remission state in the treatment groups. The patient who achieved remission have a higher DRA lipid profile as shown in this uh, diagram. So, and the, uh, other, other adverse effect, there are two cases of non-melanoma small uh, skin cancer, one case of major adverse cardiovascular uh, event, one case of pulmonary embolism, one case of deep vein thrombosis were there in this study. And there was no serious infection, gastrointestinal perforation, or malignancy, excluding NMC in the octave sustained group. So the key observation which can be concluded are lower partial Mayo score of at baseline of octave sustain was significantly associated with an increased likelihood of achieving remission and a reduced time to loss of response. Lower endoscopic subscore at baseline of octave induction 1 and 2 also associated with remission at 52. Lower PGA score at baseline of octave induction 1 and 2 was associated with loss of response during octave sustain. Corticosteroid use at baseline of octave sustain was significantly associated with increased loss of response and a reduced likelihood of remission. Higher albumin at baseline of octave induction 1 and 2 was associated with an increased likelihood of achieving remission and reduced risk of 
loss of response. Presence of extraintestinal manifestation at baseline of oxidative sustain were associated with increased risk of loss of response. Similarly, tofacitinib 10 mg BD may be more efficacious in maintaining response in more complex ulcerative colitis, that is, those who have extraintestinal manifestation manifestations. Higher CRP at baseline of octave sustain was associated with reduced likelihood of achieving remission, increased risk of loss of response among patients receiving tofacitinib of 10 mg, but not with the 5 mg group. It is noted that the extent and severity of ulcerative colitis is best assessed by endoscopy with the endoscopic subscore as a core component of Mayo score. Because CRP is an objective marker of inflammation, CRP level has been observed to correlate with the extent of disease. So in conclusion, the following characteristics can provide some uh, idea about uh, whether the patient will achieve remission or not by using trophacetin, that is partial Mayo score, uh, CRP values, age, prior corticosteroid use, and endoscopic subscore at baseline. Patient with greater clinical improvement after eight weeks of tofacitinib induction therapy are more likely to maintain response or remission with tofacitinib regardless of dose during maintenance, highlighting the importance of robust response to induction therapy. That limitation of in study was that there were small numbers uh, of patients who, uh, who have achieved remission. And although fecal, pro uh, fecal calprotectin level has shown evidence of predicting sustained efficacy, but this Maya worker is not used in octave sustain program. And uh, these are the warnings related to tofacitinib that serious infections leading, including tuberculosis, bacterial fungal infection, viral and other opportunistic infection can occur while using tofacitinib. And if a serious infection develops, stop tofacitinib until the infection subsides. Prior to starting tofacitinib, perform a test for latent tuberculosis. If it is positive, start the treatment prior to starting the tofacitinib. Monitor all patients for active tuberculosis during treatment, even if the initial latent tuberculosis test is negative. Lymphoma and other malignancies have been observed in patients treated with tofacitinib. So what uh, guidelines recommend about tofacitinib is that October 12, 2021, ECO guideline says, we recommend that tofacitinib for maintaining remission in patients with ulcerative colitis who responded to induction therapy with tofacitinib. Thank you. So, uh, very good presentation. Any comments by Dr. Sohini? Uh... Thank you, sir. Sohini, you have some comment? Uh, so the main thing uh, regarding this drug, which we need to remember is that uh, like the question has already come up, whether this drug will act in uh, the group of patients who are refractory to steroids. It has been seen that this drug will not work very well in patients who are refractory to steroids. So we need to remember that. And the other thing is when we are using them, we need to monitor the patients very strongly for other infections. Otherwise, in a specific group, it works good. Particularly herpes zoster, I was a little surprised that the yes, risk of herpes zoster was not high in this follow-up study, but uh, most of the data with tofacitinib shows almost a 5% uh, incidence of uh, herpes zoster. Yes. So that is something which we have to bother about. Um, I think uh, the indication uh, is very clear. As of now, it's a second line of therapy for severe ulcerative colitis which do not respond to NTTNF drug. It is not considered as a first-line therapy it is considered second line therapy where it may score over some of the other biologics uh, and may be used when the tnf does not work uh, the disadvantage is that um, it is only used for ulcerative colitis at this moment we have no data to suggest the use of this particular molecule for uh, uh, for crohn's disease though some of the other small molecules like pilgotinib has been uh, found to be useful in crohn's disease as well so I think uh, one big advantage which possibly needs to be highlighted, it's so easy to take. Uh, it's an oral drug and so less, uh, so cheap. I think each tablet costs only about 30 to 40 rupees. So as compared to the biologics, uh, which are very, very high cost, this is a low cost drug. The only uh, word of caution for all the residents who are listening, that uh, in India, most of the patients who come to you for the first time will be steroid, uh, who have taken steroid and they are not responding to the steroid. 
so don't jump to this uh, biological because this will not be the uh, ideal drug it's steroid refractory or steroid dependent uh, uc patient try other biologicals once they fail then probably you may think of tofacitinib in that group secondly the, the infection is an important thing and uh, with all biologicals we have to be very careful in our country because tuberculosis especially the latent tuberculosis is very common and uh, by the time we realize that the patient has a flare of tuberculosis it's too late so be very careful keep them under very close follow-up when you are prescribing biologicals to patients in our population the only thing is that vidalizumab uh, which is now available in our country does not have that risk of tuberculosis so if there is a, there's an issue of uh, tuberculosis a latent tuberculosis that may be a safe drug to use only problem is that again a uh, very costly drug so what are the disadvantages uh, do we have two min two more minutes what are the disadvantages of um, you you mentioned about four groups of drug so can you yes. can you tell us uh, what are the four groups anti tnf was one and anti -tnf anti -tnf was interleukin anti interleukin was two anti integrins were three and so, jack kinase inhibitors was so jack four. is number four so what is the anti integrin what the what are the positive point and negative point of anti integrin sir positive point is that they do not uh, have an uh, interaction with other drugs and other uh, 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 sort of uh, side effects like infections mostly and uh, uh, one uh, like vedalizumab does not have uh, like you said uh, risk of tuberculosis and uh, so far from infection point of view it is possibly the safest biologic yes. uh, the least risk of infections and that's why those who are prone to infections and particularly elderly individuals this is often used as a drug of choice uh, vidolizumab one okay. of the disadvantages is that it is very very specific to the intestines so it does not work extra intestinal manifestation it is on the, the risk of jc virus infection is not there with vidolizumab yes. Because of which some of the other molecules, related molecules, have been withdrawn from the market. Yes, sir. Natalizumab is withdrawn because it uh, enters the brain and causes JC infection. Anti interleukin drugs are not available in India, uh, so we do not have any experience uh, of using USSE. All right, I think we are nearing the end point. Uh, final comments from Dr. Sarkar and Dr. Jain. Go ahead, Shoini. Uh, so regarding the case, the only thing which I wanted to highlight is that we chose this case because it's a case of ulcerative colitis, but it had two new things to it. One is the thromboembolic uh, manifestation, which we need to keep in mind when dealing with a UC patient. And the other is not every relapse needs to be treated with higher dose of steroids. We need to rule out other infections. And this was a new molecule, which may have a very important role to play in the future because it's easy, it's cheap. And it's a second line drug, but as a second line drug, it is easy. Mine is non academic, this thing. I fully agree with Goenka, sir, that while making a slight presentation, we should be very careful and we should make good slides, good presentation, because that makes the impression much better than if your slides are poor. Even if your content are good, it will not have a good impression. So, all the residents who are listening to it, they should be careful next time when they are having their presentation please do check your presentation with all these small things it's like grammatical mistakes uh, uh, the the headers the footers and they should not be very crowded it should, the message should be very clear so that somebody who's listening should have the clear idea what you're trying to present i remember professor nayak and maybe dr ajay Jain remembers him that he would sit in the back of an audience audience and will only analyze that what is the pattern in which the slides are made and he would react to anybody who has made more than six or seven lines in the slide yes. a fault a selection of the font selection of the colors everything is so important when you make the slide and this is the time to get into that habit for the last presentation you have presented very well but if i would have been in your place i would first present the graph and then draw the conclusion from that graph what you did in most of your slide, did you gave the conclusion and then presented the data. So I think it's always yes. good to give a pictorial of the data and then say that as shown in this uh, slide, 
uh, this is so. So you yes. spend a lot of time giving the interpretation and then you said this is shown in this data. I would have done the reverse. I would okay. have first shown the graph, whether it's a forest graph or whatever it is. And then on the graph itself mentioned that as shown in this graph, this is my conclusion. Okay, so see, uh, when we present, um, uh, I mean, um, pardon me for being for critical, but then when we present, you should always understand that what will be the take home message of the people who are going to listen to me. When you present, it is not your knowledge, which is important. It is what you can impart as a knowledge to the people who are listening to your talk and what they would remember from your talk that is very, very important rather than uh, showing your knowledge or showing what you know about the subject. Yes. I, I hope I'm uh, I'm clear in what I'm trying to tell. Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. All right. So thank you very much, the Indoor team. Um, and um, uh, we would come back to you very soon uh, with the next round of presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, we would be we would love to do it at next time. We I think these boys will do much better than what they have done. I know today. that's a that's a basic as compared to.